one of my uh, biggest sort of um, problems with uh, environment is actually that I love meat. That's my personal uh, problem. And I'm not the only one, I'm afraid. Um, and we have identified, and not only us, but also the FAO, that meat consumption is a real big upcoming problem. Um, we are going to be with uh, 10 billion people, uh, 9 billion or 10 billion people, probably, um, that, that, that the increase is sort of predicted. And what's more, we are going to have increasing appetites for more complex foods. Feeding the world is a really complex problem, and it will become more complex than it is right now. That's for sure. Meat is a terribly expensive component of our food. Um, animal proteins in general, but meat and beef in particular. For one quarter pounder of hamburger, um, you need about seven pounds of food for the animal, uh, 2,000 liters of water, eight square meters of land, and enough power to power your microwave for about 10 minutes. So an incredibly resource intensive part of our diet. <clears throat> Um, in addition, and um, also these numbers are actually from the FAO um, in 2008, so everybody could know them, is that um, there's a lot of greenhouse gas emission associated with livestock rearing. Um, about 40% of all the methane and about 15 to 20% of all the greenhouse gas emission is attributed to livestock, which is a tremendous amount. You can argue about the real number, but it's really a tremendous amount. Why is that? Why is meat, animal protein, such an a terrible, um, expensive part of our component? It's because, especially cows, are really, really inefficient technologies. Right? They convert vegetable proteins into animal proteins, and they do that really, really inefficiently. If you were to design a food system right now um, based on a, a proper protein composition of our diet for, for people, um, you would never come up with a cow if you would know all the efficiencies um, that it has. Chicken, pork is better, salmon is, uh, is the best in terms of efficiency. Now, um, a question, who of you actually knew this before I mentioned these? We're kind of aware of it, quite a few. Uh, and also, okay, fine. And also the environmental issue, who was aware of the greenhouse gas emission? Quite a few also, almost half. So now comes the thing. Who of you is vegetarian? Oh, quite a few also. Well, <laughs> um, mind you, I didn't raise my hand um, uh, because I'm not a vegetarian. I'm, I'm a deeply flawed person. I know all these numbers for a long time um, and I've not been able to change my um, habits in the supermarket. And what's more, globally, this is not happening. So this is the, the human trophic level. This is where we are in the food chain. It's one for a plant, it's two for an animal that eats plants, and it's three for an animal that eats animals that eats plants. Very few animals are at five. Uh, we are at 2.35, meaning that 35% of our protein come from animals that eat plants, right? And look where India and China, uh, what path they are following in the, in the last 30 years they're gradually creeping up to that same number. And that's because, you see that on the right panel, that human trophic level, that place where we are in the food chain, is linearly related to the gross domestic product of a country. In other words, as soon as middle class incomes rise, they start to eat meat. So it's not just consumption in our part of the world, it's consumption globally, and it's especially consumption in developing economies where um, income rises. And that's where, according to the FAO, the 70% increase globally in meat demand in 2050 is coming from, right? From these trends. And of course, going from seven to nine billion people. <clears throat> so what can we do? Um, in 1932, Churchill mentions that um, at some point we would see the absurdity of growing an entire chicken when you only eat the, eat the breast and the legs. And he said, um, 50 years hence we can culture that tissue under a suitable medium. At that time, the technology really wasn't there yet um, because it had to actually await the identification of stem cells. This is a muscle cell. Uh, the biologists among you will recognize it immediately. It's a very particular cell. It's a merger between a number of cells, hence the different nuclei, 
And in the 60s, it was discovered that some of those nuclei actually did not belong to the contractile machinery of that muscle cell, but in fact had a different kind of function, apparently, and they didn't know what. In 2000, this was identified, this satellite cell was identified as the bona fide stem cell of our muscle. So all our muscle cells have stem cells. They are sitting there doing nothing, waiting to repair that tissue when it's injured. And when you have a muscle rupture, these guys come in, they proliferate, and they start to form muscle tissue so that your, scar, that your tear is actually um, replaced by um, new muscle tissue and not by a scar. <clears throat> so the technology is actually very simple. You uh, use these stem cells who are very good at proliferating and also very good because they are tissue-designated stem cells. They can only make muscle tissue and fat tissue um, to uh, create in tissue outside of the cow. <clears throat> this is part of what is collectively called a movement of cellular agriculture. Um, and Frontiers actually has an upcoming um, issue in um, uh, sustainable food systems uh, where uh, a lot of contributions in this field um, will end. Um, so the idea is very simple. You take a biopsy from a cow, um, just one centimeter long, one millimeter in diameter, has a couple of hundred of these stem cells. And uh, you let them proliferate. Of course, you need to feed them. I will come back to that later. Uh, you let them proliferate, and you let them form tissue. Um, and the first step in forming tissue is that they need to merge, because it's a merger of cells. So that's a very simple intervention. You basically um, withdraw all the, uh, the serum, uh, the growth factors, and they stop proliferating, and they start to merge, pretty much by themselves. Then the second thing that you need to do is you need to make a tissue out of those primitive muscle fibers. And I've come to realize that our uh, muscle cells, most of our cells actually have a couple of very interesting characteristics, even in culture, um, in that they do function. Uh, they form tissue, they sort of uh, seek each other out, they align, um, and muscle cells, their function is contraction. And they start to contract in a Petri dish, spontaneously. Our muscle our muscles are exercise junkies. Our brains are not, but our muscles are. So as long as they are not attached to a brain, they will contract. Um, so what we do is very simple. We put them in a temporary gel, in a ring structure around a central column, uh, let them find each other, squeeze out the water out of that gel. They do that all by themselves. Um, they start to contract, and in three weeks, um, under the microscope, they are sort of beefed up in the sense that they look the same as a muscle fiber. Um, that you take directly from the cow or from a steak from a supermarket. Um, so what we did in 2013, 2012, 2013, we made 10,000 of these muscle fibers, all by hand, extremely tedious job. Uh, my technicians were really very angry at me. Um, and we made a hamburger out of that, and we did something very unusual as scientists um, to... Uh, present that in a hybrid between a live cooking show and a press conference. It was cooked by a very courageous chef. This uh, hamburger costed us uh, a quarter million euro. <laughs> um, and it was eaten by these food critics, uh, Hanni Rutzler from Austria and Josh Schoenwald from Chicago, and they said, well, yeah, it's a hamburger, <laughs> right? Um, it's meat, no, no question. It was still a little bit dry. There was no fat tissue in it. It was not perfect. There were all sorts of issues with it. But we have basically two, re two reasons to do this. Uh, one is to show everybody it can be done. The technology is basically there. Uh, yeah, there are still a couple of issues. 250,000 euro for a hamburger, maybe not the ideal um, solution for the uh, global problem. Um, so there are still a, lot of, a couple of issues, but it can be done in principle. Uh, and the second is that we want, this was 2013, we want to steer up the discussion about meat consumption. So that kind of uh, worked. Um, at least it gave us a lot of funds to uh, work on, uh, to continue to work on this. And of course, uh, this also needs to be made um, efficient. And cell culture, some of you may know that, is not a, intrinsically a very efficient system um, because it's usually not scaled up to a very, very large scale and it's usually not the focus of those experiments or those developments to make it very efficient. But you can play with a lot of conditions. You can play with cell culture conditions. You can play with cell selection. You can scale up production. And that's exactly all those things that we are doing now. And I cannot go into all those details um, of the science. This is just one of them. 
where uh, we scale up production of these cells on microcarriers in a large bioreactor. Now, in our lab, the bioreactors are still pretty small, but the principle is the same for 25,000 liter bioreactors that are already sort of available in the industry. Uh, the cells are adherent. They need to attach to a surface, so they cannot uh, swim like bacteria or yeast. You have to attach them to a surface, at least for now. Uh, we are working on systems where that no longer is necessary, but we are not there yet. Um, so we let them grow on microcarriers that are suspended in this fluid. Um, and you see that they grow actually pretty well. And interestingly, which I had never uh, sort of expected, is once you throw in new microcarriers, they hop to the new planet, if you like, and start to colonize that, um, that microcarrier, which is from a process point of view kind of efficient and interesting. This uh, so a 25,000 liter bioreactor, we have done some calculations on it, could um, feed about 10,000 people, or at least 10,000 Europeans, um, with meat for about a year. So you can do the math, it's about 5,000 Americans, right? That's uh, 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 pretty much the, um, the ratio of meat consumption. So um, that's a 25,000 liter, maybe you don't have an idea what it is, but it's about, well, it's about this and not even that high, but it's a, the volume like this, and sort of halfway up to this area. A number of, uh, of course, this, this product isn't there yet. The process is not completely developed yet, but there were already some preliminary life cycle analyses, one from the University of Oxford, one from the University of Texas. Um, and they uh, calculated that, yes, you can reduce the amount of land. Currently, we're using 70% of all our arable land for livestock maintenance. Um, and I mentioned that 70% that the FAO predicts uh, our meat consumption will um, increase. So we have to get additional land to make that happen. Um, <clears throat> with this procedure, we uh, probably can save quite a bit of land. The est estimate here was uh, 95%. Water, talked about previously, very important, uh, 95%. Energy, the debate is kind of still out there. To me, personally, energy is a non-problem. We have energy enough on this planet. Uh, it just ne doesn't need to be associated with greenhouse gas emission. So if this works, then um, we would at least um, deflect a lot of the externalities of the increase in uh, meat consumption and the current meat consumption. In terms of sustainability, that product that we made, other than being so expensive, was still not really sustainable. We used serum to grow uh, cells, which is a traditional thing. For the last 130 years, you add serum to um, cells in culture so that they grow. And of course, the serum comes from cows. Um, and it's a non-replicative uh, material, so we cannot use it. Also, the gel in which those cells are temporarily sitting is collagen, also coming from cows. We cannot use that either. Um, and the other thing that you can do in cell culture is recycle. Nobody is doing this recycling uh, because we're all afraid of infections. I will come back to that later. But um, we will have to start doing that. <clears throat> so we grow the cells in the absence of antibiotics. Um, again, everybody is afraid of infections, but if you don't let students in your lab, you're fine. Um, <clears throat> and um, we are growing the cells in the, um, in the absence of serum. Uh, there are a lot of serum substitutes out there uh, they're very cell-specific, very tissue-specific, um, very species-specific, but you can easily find it's basically optimizing eight, nine growth factors, uh, and you can easily find the optimum uh, condition for the cells to grow. <clears throat> then um, it needs to be meat, because we are a species designed to love meat and not meat substitutes, right? Um, I could show the, uh, the, the image of a supermarket shelf uh, during Harvey, the storm in Houston, where all the shelves were empty except for the meat substitute part, right? Um, <coughs> now, this was Houston, so it was not really a, <laughs> sort of a, a, a representative, maybe. Um, but uh, meat is, is a very, very nice product. Uh, it has a very nice color. Um, it has a very um, specific bite to it. Um, and of course, it has a wonderful taste. So you need to kind of replicate all of these. Now, these, these tasters said it's fine. Uh, taste is fine. Texture is fine. Um, and of course, we had to work on that to, a little bit. One of the things that it didn't have was uh, fat tissue. 
And we found out that those same stem cells actually can be coerced to become fat tissue uh, by adding basically fatty acids. Um, uh, there are a number here mentioned. Um, they're all PPAR gamma uh, agonists, um, and they all drive that stem cell program into a fat tissue program. Surprising that it takes, um, you wouldn't say so, but it takes much longer to mature a fat cell than a muscle cell. Um, but um, so for a muscle cell, it takes about three weeks, a fat cell about two months. So it takes longer, uh, but you need less tissue. So in the end, it uh, kind of balances out. So the idea right now for the hamburger is to grow the muscle tissue separately, to grow the fat tissue separately, add 10% of the fat tissue, mix it with the 90% uh, muscle tissue, and you have a, a hamburger. The fourth uh, condition <coughs> is that uh, people need to start eating this. And that's not immediately obvious. So when we launched this in 2013, the popular press had all these wonderful uh, headlines, yuck, and frankenfood, and, and all the things that you don't want to associate with, uh, with uh, food. Uh, and it really frustrated me, because um, nobody could explain to me what that yuck was, what sort of that emotional response against uh, this type of meat was, or this type of uh, food. And one of my dilemmas was this. This is a hot dog. Who of you have ever eaten a hot dog? Do you know what's in it? <laughs> or, or how it's being, I, I hear, I don't want to know. <laughs> and that's typically the response that, that I get. Um, and I have an even worse sort of example in the Netherlands, um, where people really don't want to know what's in it. They're afraid that they won't eat it anymore after they know. So we are perfectly capable of eating stuff that we don't know what it is or how it's being made. So how is that different for a cultured hamburger coming from my lab, which I can assure you is completely trustworthy? Um, so, my, uh, and, and nobody even could explain this. And I think it has to do with safety. You see neighbors eat those, hamburger, or those, uh, those, those hot dogs and they stay alive. Right? We are biologically programmed not to eat stuff that we don't know because it might kill you. If you go into the forest and you, and you just randomly pick mushrooms and you start to eat them, uh, you can be in trouble. So safety is an important issue. And for every new product, that is going to be the issue. So that takes time. It takes early adopters and it takes time. Of course, we have early adopters galore. At one point, made the mistake of um, sending out a call for courageous people who want to try this. And of course, my email block box exploded. Um, so that we have, we have um, adventurous people in office. And then, uh, of course, um, you develop that um, trust gradually. Then there is the issue of control. Um, we tend to, when, when we get um, introduced to a new technology, we tend to get images in our head of how is, this is going to be implemented in society. Immediately, that association is made. So, um, we think about large factories, maybe in faraway countries where we don't have control over um, the system. I told you about that 25,000 25, liter bioreactor, which is already, in my mind, a large scale. 10,000 people, you could do that in a neighborhood, let's say, in, um, in London. Uh, you have a small farm there, a petting zoo, like one of these petting zoos where the kids go from primary schools, they feed the animals, they pet the animals, they give them names. Um, once in a while you poke them in the butt to get their stem cells, and in the barn next to the farm you grow muscle for the, or, or, or meat for the neighborhood. So a microbrewery type of system. You can, um, uh, you can visit those, uh, I'm, this is storytelling, right? Um, <laughs> Um, you can visit those barns uh, on Sunday, and you have complete control over how your meat is being produced, kind of the organic variant of cultured meat. Um, in the same area, you can grow the feed for the animals, um, and you have sort of a local production of, and a very controlled production of hamburgers. Um, and then the last thing is culture. Uh, we associate meat with a certain culture, with uh, uh, masculinity, with power, with uh, killing animals, with blood, with uh, campfires, and a laboratory is not a very romantic environment, right? And most people actually don't know what a laboratory looks like, and they think of dangerous places where things are cooking and boiling in different colors and exploding, so you need goggles and you need gloves and all those things, and not the ideal sort of birthplace of your meat. So we have to work on that, maybe start a soap series where, uh, that, that runs in a laboratory. Um, 
it's not that bad with, um, uh, with the acceptance. We did a study in the Netherlands where we basically wanted to know which type of information actually affects this acceptance. So we asked four acceptance questions. Um, and we divided the, the population in three groups. One got information about societal benefits, one on personal benefits, it's good for you, and one got information on it's just a nice meat quality. And then we had them taste a piece of regular hamburger and a piece that was labeled as a cultured hamburger, which in fact was also a regular hamburger. Um, and uh, it's kind of a busy slide, so we asked, are you in favor? Do you want to taste it? Do you want to buy it? Do you want to replace your meat with uh, this? And the interesting thing, even be before we gave information, um, acceptance levels are in the range of 50%, which we find throughout the world, actually, which is already pretty high. Of course, it's kind of theoretical, but... And the other interesting thing is whatever information you give, um, that acceptance increases, and it doesn't really matter what type of information you give. Information is key. It was mentioned um, earlier in um, the talk um, about um, uh, marine life. Information is key. Um, and then, uh, interestingly also, what I found interesting is that 92%, even before they got any information, wanted to taste it. So people are kind of adventurous, and apparently that safety is not immediate safety. It's not, it's going to kill me in a couple of seconds. It's going to kill me in a couple of years. Uh, once you have accepted this idea, you can think of all sorts of other things that you can do. You can make this meat healthier for you. We can make sort of more omega-3 fatty acids in that, um, in that fat component um, or take out um, things, for instance, that increase the risk for colorectal cancer. <clears throat> Up to two years ago, I was the only one doing this. We were the only ones doing this, which is kind of scary, I must say. Um, uh, and right now, I have to update this slide every uh, couple of weeks. A couple of startup companies um, start to do the same thing uh, for chicken, for, um, for fish, uh, and also for uh, beef. Um, of course, there are also other um, animal tissues, animal proteins that you need to think about. For instance, leather and milk. Um, and there are increasingly good um, plant-based substitutes. Funders among them are Sergey Brin and Bill Gates and Tyson, uh, no, sorry, um, uh, Branson, but also now, interestingly, the larger meat industries like Cargill and Tyson and in, um, in Europe as well. So in my mind, this now is sort of gaining momentum and is going to happen. So this is my ideal future where we can still barbecue um, and have our favorite food, at least for the 95% non-vegetarians, without the negative externalities on the planet, um, food security and animal welfare. Thank you. <laughs>